Hello, my name is Dr. Penelope Perkins Vesey. I'm a post harvest physiologist with North Carolina State University. I'm located at Plants for Human, the Plants for Human Health Institute in Kannapolis, North Carolina. Um, today, I'm going to talk about post harvest best practices for strawberries. These are a little bit more specific than for general berries. Okay, first question here is uh, one thing that, that um, even I tend to forget is that I make this assumption, but forget that this isn't really something most people think about, is that fruits and vegetables are alive after they're harvested, including strawberries. So that means they continue to respire, they're giving off, they're using carbon sources and they're giving off water and, and uh, oxygen, and they're losing the organic acids and the sugars that make them sweet. Uh, and the loss of water can lead to weight loss and shrivel or wrinkling. And a lot of this whole respiration process is very dependent on the storage temperature that you use or what the harvest temperature is, and it can greatly affect your post-harvest life. So why are strawberries so fragile? Well, I'd like to contrast these with apples because they're small, for one thing. They have no starch reserves like apples, and ethylene is not going to help strawberries ripen, or nor is blocking ethylene going to help uh, strawberry life. And on top of this, they have to be almost fully ripe because they don't have any reserves except for what's coming from the plant. So once you pick them, that's where they stop. They also have a thin cuticle, really more of a, a peel almost than a cuticle, which makes them very prone to bruising. And they have to be picked into the final container. And then they also need very rapid cooling and cold chain management after the fact. And then the other assumption that you have to make about strawberries is that consumers will most likely eat them without washing. They, they generally don't think about washing fruits or in a clamshell. So what is the ideal ripeness for strawberries? So it should be three quarter to full red color. So if you look in this middle picture here, the two on the far right would be the closest to what you would wanna harvest. Um, they should look bright and glossy. They should you know, just kind of gleam at you when the sun is hitting them. That's a sign that they're fresh and also that they're not too dark. Uh, the larger size tends to help. Most people, especially consumers in general, the bigger the better. Um, there is a point of which, you know, if you have two berries in the clamshell, they might object, but usually larger helps and not malformed. And I didn't, I didn't find you a picture of this, but sometimes malforming can, can ca be caused by um, <clears throat> a bug injury on the tip of the a berry or sometimes frost. Um, mostly it's the biggest problem is they're lumpy looking or they have a hole in them because they've split because of frost. Also, the what you pick or what type you pick and what stage you pick at is going to depend on, depend on your distance to market and also the variety. So if you're really soft type like Seascape is considered pretty soft for strawberries, you almost have to pick them in between this stage and this stage. They still, still might have a little bit of white left on them because they are so soft. Uh, whereas some of the older, well, Camarosa is still considered a standard around here. Um, that's a fairly tough strawberry and can be picked fully red and still be fine. Also the sepals, and those are this green part here. These need to be green and they need to look fresh, not wilted. I'm going to look and I'm going to show you what happens after harvest so you can see the difference here. And next slide. So at, usually you can get five to 18 days of storage life. Now this is a huge variation. It's going to depend on your variety. The ripeness stage, harvest style, cooling time, cold chain, everything can make a difference. You know, if it's cooler when you harvest them, you're probably gonna get a few more days out of their storage life. For instance, when we harvest here, when one year I found we harvested in February uh, in tunnels and we got much better shelf life than harvesting in April out in the field. So all those can affect your shelf life. So what you're looking for after storage, same thing, glossy, lighter color. So here on the far right, here are red, bright red fruit, here are darker red fruit. These are at the point where consumers tend to think these are overripe. You go down here, these were definitely left around. Um, the Akeens are really, the little seeds are really sticking up and you can start to see injury points here. These would be from touching them, bruising them. Um, these show up a lot after they've been sitting in post-harvest, especially when they've got two or 3% weight loss coming off, this makes everything so much more evident. And this is really where you lose the loss is when you get weight loss issues. Okay, and the other thing you don't want is decay injury. We talked about bruising. Okay, these berries were held at 20 degrees C. Um, you can see mold forming already, and this is six days into storage. So um, you can really quickly get mold and, and no consumer will buy something with mold on it. And then the other thing to think about again is the sepals. Here, these are pretty dried out and not even what I call green anymore. These are green sepals, fresh, 
looking fully expanded. These are still green, but they're starting to wilt. So you see the difference here. And if you think about it after a while, it took me a while to realize your subconscious gives you all kinds of triggers as to what you consider is fresh. And it just takes a while to figure out exactly what it is that you're realizing is fresh. And then the other thing about quality in, in strawberries is people really want them sweet. Now, that's a hard one because sometimes it's, if the weather is wrong, it's too wet, for instance, don't have enough sun, it's hard to get your bricks above 5%. Um, but then there are people who tell me they can easily get 12% bricks. And this can depend on a number of things as well. Sun is very important and also the right temperature, but not too, you know, not too warm, but a good temperature for the strawberries to still respire, but also gain sugar. And the other that can be how you're doing your fertility. If you're adding more potassium in your, in your water system, for instance, a lot of growers will swell back potassium and calcium to increase the sweetness. So those are the important parts about quality before and after harvest. Um, just a quick note on pre-harvest, we have always pushing gaps here to make sure things are cleaned up so you don't get illnesses. Okay, so harvest and handling. So you wanna pick when dry, very important with strawberries. If you're wet, you tend, if they're the bruises, if they're, the strawberries are wet, they tend to bruise. Also, it's hard to get them to dry. So then they have a nice little puddle of water that decay or mold can set up into. So try and pick when they're dry. Certainly try and pick early in the morning when it's cooler and, or at least shortly after rain when, when the fruit have dried off and it's still not too hot. And harvest into pint to gallon size containers. So you don't want, here, these are pulp containers. It's pretty common in the strawberry world. Um, these gallon containers, especially the mesh, are really popular for UPIC systems or down here, um, these right here, because you notice they're fairly shallow. So that means you're gonna, not going to get a big stack of strawberries on top of each other. Clamshells are still the most used for strawberries, um, maybe the hardest to pick into into the field, uh, but still the most widely used, especially for sales. And then the other thing is make, try and make sure you can keep the fruit in the shade. And up here is, is a good canopy system that could be very useful for you. If you don't have a lot of money, these are fairly cheap. Um, just a quick and dirty way to keep your fruit shaded without putting them under trees where you might have birds landing on them. And then also, if you have a cooler nearby or a packing shed, it's important to take those fruit to their cooler frequently so you can start to get the field heat out of them. All right, cauldrons and cooling. And this is where I'm putting most of the time in on this talk. So the first thing I wanna say is, you know, you've got to get the field heat out. And so there's a lot of field heat that builds up in a crop. Even at 70 degrees out in the field, it's amazing how warm that crop will get. And the closer it is together in a pack on the back of the truck, the more the heat that builds up, it's harder to get the heat out of the center of that pack. So usually with, with smart strawberries here, at least for this group, um, we're talking only about room cooling or forest air cooling or both. Uh, we're not gonna talk about weighting the fruit there. That there's work being done on that. That's beyond the scope of this, of this talk. And the point of doing the cooling is you're de delaying respiration, really you're slowing down your respiration, which in turn will de decrease your weight loss and your softening rates and also stop or slow decay or mold development. And then the key here, point is here, is that when this is for blackberry and raspberry, but what happens is you're at 32 degrees Fahrenheit and you've got about 14 days of shelf life on a blackberry. But if you go to room temperature at 68, your, your uh, shelf life just went to two days. So this is why it's so important to introduce a cooling step. If you plan to be selling, even if you don't plan to be selling, a lot of people think, well, I have a pick operation or I'm just gonna be at a farm stand. So I really don't need much for refrigeration. Well, always plan ahead plan on needing twice or three times the refrigeration capacity you think you're going to need. Uh, it's amazing you end up with a situation where for whatever reason your customers didn't show up that day or you have a rain event, you have to hold fruit over or you're anticipating a rain event and suddenly you need that refrigerated storage. So think about that before the season starts. And here's a contrast for strawberry itself. So I talked about this slide a little earlier. So here's room temperature, 20 C, 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Here's 41 degrees Fahrenheit or 5 C. Look at the difference after six days between these fruit. He's starting to get mold on these. They still look glossy. These are getting very unappealing looking and their sepals have turned kind of a dark and muddy olive green. So very important to remember to uh, concentrate on your cooling, have it available. So usually with cooling on strawberry, you're going to bring the fruit to the pack house. You're going to place it in a cold room. You might have a forced air step in, involved as well. Once the forest air cooling has been done, you move it back into the cold room so that you can keep the, the heat where it belongs, which is outside the forest air unit. 
Uh, one thing to remember is most small fruits will not freeze if kept below 32 degrees Fahrenheit. You can keep strawberries between 28 and, and 41, basically. It's, it's a fairly widespread. Um, lots of times, 33 to 38 degrees Fahrenheit is used, uh, even though that's a little higher than, than recommended. This is probably the safer accommodation for a lot of people to make sure that their systems don't freeze up. Sometimes the cooler will freeze up. And then sometimes 41 degrees Fahrenheit is the safest you can go for a cold room. It's not ideal, but it's certainly better than no cooling at all. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about time to cooling. So if you're a commercial grower, the idea is you want to get to at least half or seven eighths of the cooling time. So if you bring it in at 68 degrees Fahrenheit, which would be a pretty cool day in North Carolina, you, you're, here's your initial product temperature. And it's going to take about six hours to get to seven eighths cooling. It's going to take about two hours to get to half cool. So by that time, so now you've gone from 68 degrees Fahrenheit, now you're down to 10, which is about to about 50. Um, so you're down here at 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a whole lot better. And then here down here, you're closer to freezing or 32 uh, when you get to seven eighths cooling. So it depends on what type of investment you're making, what type of system you have, and how much time you can afford to cool. Uh, do you have two hours or do you have six hours? At the very least, you probably should be thinking at least get a two-hour cooling system in there because you're at least removing half the heat by that point. Cold rooms. So you can make your own cold rooms. You can buy these. Um, they, uh, you definitely have to watch your insulation, though. You can lose a lot of insulation through the door and the ceiling, which are places people don't always think about to insulate. You must also make sure you have the right refrigeration capacity for your expected heat load and volume. So think of, this is again, planning ahead and doing the calculations to think what your heat load might be. It helps if you can put these units under shade like this one, it's been placed in a, a, a barn system um, to keep down the cooling load that you're going to get. You've got something between you and the sun. Also, it helps to protect them from the wind and the rain, uh, especially if you're going in and out of it a lot. And make sure you leave room inside the cooler that you've made a big enough capacity so you can move your pallets around and stacking. So you, you have to have some volume in between here for effective air movement, which we'll go over. Also, it's, these are pretty cheap. You can add a plastic curtain and this will reduce your loss of cold air. Um, say you have to go in and out of this three or four times a day with another load of starbreeze. Well, by minimizing the, you know, instead of having this whole area open to the elements, you now only have a little bit open for a short period of time. Um, so you're gonna have less volume of air that has to be recooled and, and, and is lost. Types of cold rooms. Okay, tons of them out there. Shipping containers are pretty popular. They're, they're fairly low cost and they're fairly well made. They don't have as many leaks as, as like a railroad container does. So people can retrofit these with electric motor and a diesel generator system for the cooling part of it. Self-constructed is very popular. This one right down here is self-constructed. We added a cool bot AC unit and a cool bot inside. Um, used restaurant cold and freezer rooms are very popular. You can usually pick these up fairly cheaply. Um, I, I talked about converting AC unit to cooling, take a home air conditioning unit and use this by using a cool bot. Um, this is the site to go to to find this information. It has a wealth of information on how to build your own. They're fairly simple to do and they can save you money. So maybe you don't have time for that. Okay, here's first, here's a cool bot. This is what it looks like. Very simple device, very small. It's like $300, $350 now for these. And then you can trot down and get a AC unit. Your local Home Depot used to have a lot of these. They're all digital. These are the ones that work have to be digital. And there's specific brands on the website to, to make sure you get. And basically what you're doing is making this AC unit stop. You know, usually it would stop at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. But the, the cool bot system is designed to fool it into going lower. You can go down to about 36 degrees Fahrenheit with it. So it's not going to be the most efficient or best cooling for your strawberries if, they're, if you need to have them closer to zero. But it's certainly cheap. I mean, this whole unit is fairly cheap to put in. Plus, you don't, if it goes bad on you, you don't have to call out the AC person. You can go pull out this unit yourself and go get a replacement. So you're back in business again. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of interest in using the system. They're being used for everything. People use them in bathrooms. They use them in wine coolers, use them in closets. Um, not just for cold, cold storage, but this is a great place to go to learn more in information about it. Uh, one of the things I wanted to point out with room cooling, this is a fairly passive and slow system. So what you have to do is make sure that you've thought through a little things like I was talking about leaving air movement areas. So you wanna leave spaces between your, say you have this many pallets. Um, you wanna make sure you have space between them. You don't want them all 
pushed together like this because you'll end up with a heat load right in the middle. And you'll notice that these containers here that are holding these, this in this case, blackberries, these are vented. So this allows movement of air both through these vents here and across. These are also reinforced corners. So if you are getting into the clamshells and you think you might be selling a lot, uh, certainly look into these masters. Uh, most packing places carry these. You can usually find a lot of local. Um, if you have a lot of horticulture in your area, you can find these, these um, things for sale. Some of the other ones will sell, like Monty Packaging will sell them to you. Um, they tend to cost more when you go to Monty, um, unless you have a local provider that carries that packaging. But they're very useful for helping you get the cooling done. Next, forced air cooling. Okay, I'm going to briefly go over this. You can make your own. Okay, this is anywhere from a small system where you can set up a box fan, basically. You've got, say you've got six cartons of black uh, strawberries you need to cool down, okay? We put them about a foot apart here. Here's a box fan from Walmart. You know, think, pretend this is a box fan. Put it here so that the exhaust system is facing outward into the room. Put a piece of tarp over this. And this is what it's gonna look like over here, okay? This is a big scale one. So you got your tarp over here, you turn your fan on, and what it's doing is creating a little negative vacuum pressure here in the tunnel. And it's put, basically pulling the cold air from the room in through these boxes so that it manages to effectively cool across those boxes pretty quickly. It'll cut your time down to cooling to about half of, say it took two hours to cool this load using four stairs, a four stair cooler, it's gonna take you probably about 15 minutes um, to cool these six boxes and it'll, it'll cool it down to half temperature for you. But the most important thing really about forced air cooling is it reduces the heat buildup in the center of the load. So if you've got a lot of material coming in and you need to get things chilled down quickly and move them out, this is the way to go. Um, fairly cheap and inexpensive system. Now you can, get, can of course get pricey. When you go to this system, you have built-in plenums, you have big squirrel cage motors. So this of course this is going to be considerably more expensive than a little box fan from Walmart. One thing I hadn't added until recently was I realized that people needed to know how to calculate their refrigeration needs. This is a fairly long process and I found the best place to go was this website where it leads you through each part because there's all of these outside sources of heat, not just heat of respiration, but you know the heat that's generated by people and equipment and movement. And of course, for a small garage, that might not be such a big deal, but it's much easier to go to this website and basically plot in the numbers uh, to calculate what you need. Uh, also, I added this because while I was finding this, I found a little paper that some undergrads had done on using ground stores. So if you happen to have some old root cellars that are underutilized or a cellar in your house that's, you know, like 50 or 55 degrees, that's worth looking at as a possible place to store an extra load of fruit that you don't have room for. So quickly after cooling, of course, what you're trying to do is keep your cold chain going. The cold chain is, is cooling them down and keeping them cold. So what you want to do is, de depending on what kind of transit you want, you want to pre-cool your transit and avoid the outside air contact. That also could add on condensation. You don't want to rewarm strawberries that get condensate on them. So what you can do, for instance, say you just have a small load going to the farmer's market. Get yourself a nice chest, pre-cool it. Put it in your cold room. Uh, put in some jugs, some old milk jugs that are they've been uh, rinsed out and filled with water and frozen. Now you have some ice blocks that are fairly easy to, to use and they'll keep the inside cool and then you can add your fruit inside here. A fairly inexpensive system. So you get more, now you've exceeded your, or maybe you just wanna use this on site. Well, okay, say you've got a van or a truck or something like that, so pre-cool it. Get, get that temperature inside down to 60. It's not gonna to get to 36, obviously, but at least get it to 60 before you start loading. It's a lot easier to get that load of heat out on a hot vehicle before you load than after you load. And then of course, if you're getting to be at the big stage of growing, you have refrigerated trucks, you have loading docks, you back it up to your loading dock uh, and make sure that your fruit never sees the light of day that's coming from a cooler inside this building directly into the truck. And then if you wanna monitor your temperatures, um, there's anything from Delta track to recorders, uh, you can follow the temperatures if you're curious about this. These are like $15 a piece. Um, a hobo unit will track your humidity as well. And these are about $100, $140, so a little bit pricier. Um, but if you want to make sure what's going on with your, with your loads, this is, these are some possibilities. There's also some eye buttons available. Those are fairly cheap. If you just want temperature, they're around about $30 a piece. Um, so some options there to, to follow your fruit and kind of figure out what's going on. Resources, very important. Check these resources out if at all possible. 
uh, for one thing, here's one for the Farm Service Agency. These guys will come out, come around and do, do loans for various reasons. For a while, they were doing one to reduce energy costs and, and refrigerated coolers fell into this category, especially with cool bot systems. So you can get some, some microloans basically for some products fairly, at fairly low cost. If you can find this information, it tends to be state by state to how accessible it is. I mentioned stirretcold.com, it's a great place to go. They also sell these pre-made storage units for you. Um, if you're not into do-it-yourself stuff, it's about $5,000 or so for these. And then we made a mobile cooler some time ago here. And we, the idea was it has a generator on a cool bot system. So we could take it to the field and pre-cool the field if we're too far away from our, from our distribution center or our pack house, that would be an option to do right in the field kind of system. Um, there's some other sources of information, of course, NC State's uh, post-harvest extension publications, also SAF's growing together.org has information on post-harvest. Um, Cornell has a small forest air cooler on their website, and of course, storeitcold.com. The USDA handbook has information on sheets on how to store strawberries, grading standards, also very important to look at. And then UC Davis has a nice website that shows all kinds of publications for free on the types of produce, how to store them, what temperatures are best, et cetera. Um, and then I'll mention this briefly, American Trailers of the Carolinas. They took the mobile unit idea and they built it out more. So you don't have to just do a cool buy. You could get a bigger size and you could get another cup of refrigeration system. And that is all I have. Um, so I'll open this up for questions. I'll be sharing with you all. <laughs>